All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good break. This is uh, CSEE 317. I'm Jason Bakos. I think, uh, I don't know if any of you have had me in a class before this. So I also teach CSE 611, although I think, uh, I think most of you take that after this one. Um, we're gonna be, in the, for this class, we're gonna meet every Monday in this room at 2.20 to 3.35. I noticed that the schedule, for some reason, has a bug in it. It says that the class is only 50 minutes, which they should be fixing. I don't know what happened there, but uh, um, it's, it should be um, 75 minutes for lecture in this room on Mondays and 75 minutes for lab on Wednesday. Uh, we normally would have two sections, but uh, we got a low enrollment this semester. I'm not sure why. It should be only 17 in this class, although I guess only I only got 10 right now. Um, I've got the uh, course schedule on there, which is uh, similar to what we did last spring, so we should be sticking to that. The textbook is listed on here. It's Embedded System Interfacing by Marilyn Wolf. That's just a reference book, though. Um, when I chose that one, I couldn't, it was the best one I could find. Uh, but this semester I'm writing my own textbook and I'll be publishing the, um, uh, the, the drafts of that on, on Dropbox so you'll have access to it. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to keep up uh, with where we are in, in, in writing that. Um, but e even if I don't, all the information you'll need is, is, uh, is in the lecture slides and in the other material that I, that I post online. So that book's just a reference book. It's not, it's not uh, required. Next Monday is a holiday. So class is canceled. And then lab is gonna be canceled this week and next week as well because I, I won't be able to get far enough in the lecture today to have, to have you do anything in the lab. So this is a you know half-half lecture lab course and um, it, it I'll spend you know half the time covering concepts and the other half will be hands-on stuff. And so you'll be doing four lab projects in the lab uh, with the help of me and the TA. Uh, speaking of the TA, the TA is Angela Kalinko, who's one of my PhD students. And she's located up in my lab in uh, the Story building at room 2236. I'm also up there in room 2213. Okay, so just to, just to um, just to just to emphasize that we'll, we'll cancel lab this week and next week and class is canceled next week okay for the holiday uh, the grading structure uh, has four categories so we'll have some uh, programming and lab assignments which is a significant part of this course it's weighted at 41.2 percent of the grade we'll have a midterm and a final midterm is 17.65 the final is 23.5 and, and then we'll have quizzes periodic quizzes that there you go, that collectively comprise 17.65% uh, of the grade. Um, for the lab projects, and as, as I mentioned, there's four of them. We have some, some guidelines for those. Your projects have to compile, and three of the four projects will have a hardware and software component, and both of those will have to compile to receive uh, any credit. Uh, you have to submit uh, the projects on Dropbox by 11.59 p.m. on the due date to receive full credit, but if you can't get it done uh, in time, there's only a 5% late penalty per school day, and it's capped at 30%. So even if you turn in the labs all at the end of the semester, there's only a 30% penalty. Um, at most, each student can only submit one project, one version of any lab, and uh, or project rather, lab project, um, and any projects not submitted uh, by the end of reading day, which is April 25th, will receive a zero. Uh, lecture and lab attendance is optional. And the lectures, I post the lectures on my YouTube channel. So if you miss a lecture or if you wanna watch it again, or listen to it again or review something, you just look up my, uh, my YouTube channel and I'll have a link on Dropbox to all the lectures, the individual lectures. So uh, you can catch those on there. And the labs uh, are intended for you to be able to meet in there with the TA to get help to answer questions uh, and help you. Uh, but generally speaking, you'll have to spend more time on the, the projects than, than you would normally get just if you worked on it in lab. You know? so, um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, let's see, anything else here? 
Uh, I think that's about it. I have a standard grading scale. Uh, the cutoff's at 90, 85, 80, 75, 70, 65. And um, for the electronic resources, I'll be using Dropbox. Hopefully you guys are, I think you guys are all familiar with Dropbox, right? Moodle, uh, that's the departmental teaching site. I don't use Blackboard. I use, I put everything on Dropbox. So you'll submit your projects on Dropbox. I'll post all the materials on Dropbox and your grades will be on Dropbox as well. Um, I, this is what it looks like right now. You can see my, uh, my little graphic where I, this is the board that we used to use in this class that I did a little Photoshop and made it put CSE 317 in the silk screen. Uh, we use the FPGA boards now in the lab. Uh, you've got some downloads here. Uh, so, you know, I've got some manual user guides on here and, and auxiliary files you need for the projects. The syllabus is also available on here. And then I just post the schedule as we go. And you'll see that there's a, a column here for the lecture slides, uh, as well as the chapters from that textbook that I was telling you about that I'm writing for the class, as well as the quizzes. The quizzes are mostly uh, once a week or so. So you just have, you have a, from the time I assign the quiz to the next class to take it, and I've already got one quiz on there. They're short quizzes, multiple choice on Dropbox. You just, just it's just a, mostly a tool for me to assess how well I'm, I'm presenting the material. Um, uh, so like I said, PowerPoint slides, textbook, quizzes, and the labs are all linked off of this schedule here. And you can see that the lab is, um, uh, is canceled this week and next week. I don't know, actually, I don't think it'll be canceled the third week. That's, that's a typo. I need to fix that. Uh, and I also give the exams through Dropbox as well. So you can just, I generally just give you a week to take it. Uh, the quizzes have no time limit, you get two attempts. Uh, the exams have a 75 minute time limit from the time you take it and you get one attempt. Make sense? Any questions? Yes? Um, are the lab projects partner work or are they individual? Normally they're partner work, but the reason, the main reason is because we don't have enough workstations for everyone, but now we do. Okay. So, I wasn't planning on doing partners. I was planning on just, because the problem when, when you have groups is that there's never a, an equal contribution by both members of the group. And these labs, in this class in particular, in 611, they're, they're, the labs are tougher. In this class, they're a little easier. Uh, this is not intended to be as a, as a difficult class as 611. So I think we'll be okay if we just do them individually. That was my plan. Um, unless anyone you know has any major objections. I, I don't think there's gonna be uh, any issues with that. I think it works out better that way anyway. Okay, um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so what is this class all about? It's called Computer Systems Engineering. I inherited this class and I, when I inherited it several years ago, I, I redesigned it. And originally it was just a concepts class. It was just a classroom class originally before I got it. When I took it over, I redesigned it because we, our, our department got put on probation from ABET uh, because they said that we didn't have enough hands-on laboratory classes. They basically, the ABET, which is the accreditation agency, they came in and they said, oh, you have a computer engineering program, but do you have a lab with oscilloscopes in it? And we said, no. They said, mm, you kind of need that if you're computer engineering. You need a lab with like scopes and soldering stations and power supplies. You better do that. <laughs> better get one <laughs> or you're in trouble. Um, so the dean invested about a million dollars to update 3D22 in Swear Engine. And so we outfitted it with all the scopes and stuff. And then I, it, it was my job to find a way to, to use them. Um, and so I worked for a while coming out, throwing around different ideas. And then we had the pandemic, which, you know, then I had to, you know, move everything virtually. <laughs> so I had to convert it back into a concepts class. Um, so it's, it's been a little chaotic. Um, and then, you know, I had some students that were helping me develop material and then the students left suddenly. So it, it's been, it's been kind of crazy. So the current incarnation of this class is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smattering of different topics which all relate to computer systems in some way. 
And the emphasis is cyber physical systems or, you know, like Internet of Things type devices. That's the idea. And the, the secondary emphasis is to bridge the two other courses we teach, 611 and 313. Uh, so we started using the FPGA boards. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those, but the little project boards that we have in the lab. And so we, we now use those same boards for all three of the, uh, the classes, the, this one, 313, 611. Um, and in this class, we're combining topics from 313 and 611. Um, and although, it's, like I said, there's, it's kind of a simpler version, but the idea is, is that once you take this class, you'll be better prepared to take those other classes. Does that make sense? So uh, computer system, the definition of a system is a set of things that work together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. And so in my view, to teach systems engineering, we need to cover some hardware design. And so I'll be covering system Verilog, which is basically a programming language for designing large scale digital circuits. And FPGAs, which are programmable logic devices, they basically allow you to design a chip without fabbing, without taping it out, fabbing it. You can. An FPGA is like a blank slate that you can electronically program to build your own digital system. And so we'll be, uh, that's the hardware part. And then a big part of computer systems engineering is interfacing, where you're you know, doing hardware, software uh, uh, communication. You're, you're, you're communicating with peripherals, IO devices. And so we cover interfacing protocols and um, I haven't gotten to queuing theory last semester. I taught it when we were uh, doing it virtually. I, I don't know if I'll get to that or not. Um, and then for the, the other part is control. Um, cyber physical systems exert some kind of control over the physical world. Uh, you might say like, like a self-driving car, smart thermostat, um, robot, right? So we're going to cover control theory and real-time systems, or the two kind of sub sub areas there. So these are all uh, these are all kind of different topics, but uh, they're all tied together of this theme of of not only computer systems in general, but also cyber physical systems in particular. So every class you've taken up to this point, I think probably with the ex uh, well, with the exception of robotics, you guys take you took robotics, right? Two seventy four. Most of your courses in this department deal with uh, desktop, you know, programming desktop laptops and servers, right? Um, in this class, uh, as I mentioned, we're focusing on embedded and cyber physical systems. So an embedded system is a computer that is an integral part of something. Um, and generally in embedded systems, you, you write software once and it just gets reused continuously. So they're not general purpose computers. They're specific, they're designed for specific application. Uh, so an example of an embedded system would be like a you know, computer in a car, a smart speaker, smart watch, drone, router, camera, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and then a cyber physical system is a subset of embedded systems. And cyber physical systems are embedded systems that link sensing, computation, and control. So they're specifically embedded systems that control something in the physical world. They used to just call those microcontrollers, but now the buzz term is cyber physical systems. So of the, of the ones that I've pictured here, only some of these are cyber physical systems, like the self-driving car, of course, would be a cyber physical system. Um, uh, the router, maybe. <laughs> Uh, smartwatch, probably not, but like if you had an attitude con control system on a you know, spacecraft, that would obviously be a cyber physical system because it's controlling something, right? So th uh, that's the emphasis of this class around cyber, cyber physical systems, which also are embedded systems. Uh, so the main, you might say, well, what's the difference? Like you said, you know, none of our other courses have focused on embedded systems. They've all been just general computer programming courses. Um, the, the difference, the, the, the thing that differentiates embedded systems from regular computers, it, in, my, in my view, are, are basically two things. The, the first is that embedded systems are designed around constraints. Um, with an embedded system, because they're designed for specific purpose, you don't want to put any more hardware in there than you need to you know, achieve their, their, their objective, their task. Um, and, and you're generally also try, usually trying to optimize the design of those systems in some way. Uh, and then constraints are kind of maximum values you can have for a system. Like for example, you, a lot of times, the most important one is probably power envelope. So if you have a processor in a system, you generally have a limit on how much power that thing 
can use. Um, also performance, you don't need more performance than you need, but on the same token, a lot of embedded systems have real time constraints, meaning that they have to perform uh, in a way where they can keep, keep up with the physical world. They have some real time constraint. Uh, they have to be able to make decisions at a certain minimum rate, or they have to have a certain minimal uh, latency from the time an input comes in to the time they have to produce their corresponding output. So performance is important. You have to achieve a certain level of performance, but you don't have to go beyond that. So you, you basically want to put in the hardware and design it to, be, to, meet, to meet the requirements without necessarily going over. And another big part of embedded uh, of constraints is interconnectivity, I.O. channels. How many I.O.s can I, can I communicate with with the system? Cyber-physical systems tend to have a lot of I.O.s. They have a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs um, that they communicate with. So when you have a processor, a microcontroller, it has a certain number of I.O.s that it can, can support, and you need to make sure that it supports enough uh, for the application. And then I, I mentioned, too, the optimization goal is where it is the thing that gives you a competitive edge over other equivalent devices or products. So, um, for example, uh, in that case, you may want to you may want to have a system that's more efficient than than someone else's, so the battery lasts longer, or maybe it is faster. You know, it, has, it, it can support a higher frame rate, or or something like that. So, embedded systems. When you do, when you work in embedded systems, it's it's a lot of discussion about uh, constraints and optimization goals, and then there's this notion of a trade-off, which is where you trade one of these parameters for another. So you can, and there's, there's always trade-offs. You can always get more of something, but you have to lose something else. So an example of that is power envelope and performance. There's this natural trade-off there. If you have a processor that powers a, an electronic greeting card, you, you know, that thing runs off of a very small battery and it has to sit on the shelf for a long time and you want it to last for a while before the battery dies. And so those things have a very low power envelope. Usually it's one to 10 milliwatts. If you, you know, go to CVS and grab a greeting card that plays a song when you open it, right? But at the same time, you know, it has a correspondingly low uh, level of, of throughput in terms of, uh, in this case, I'm measuring throughput in instructions per second. So it may be one to 10 milliwatts, but those processors can only do about one to 10 million instructions per second. And then as you move up the scale, as you go with a larger power envelope, uh, you can get more performance. So for example, with the processor in this, like the augmented reality glasses, you know, you want those to be in the 10 to 100 milliwatt range based on, you know, the type of battery you can fit in there. But you also need enough performance to be able to do real-time tracking on those things to, to make the augmented reality work. And so, you know, you may get 10 to 100 million instructions per second. And then probably the heaviest weight embedded processors you'll see are the ones that are like in the Tesla, which, you know, are basically 100 watt processors, but they can do, you know, 10 to 100 giga, a billion instructions per second, right? So there's this kind of spectrum where you can go less power, but you're going to sacrifice performance, right, for those. But there's another trade-off that you may not be aware of, and this one I think is kind of interesting, is if you look at power envelope versus efficiency. So, for example, the, um, if you look at like the, the, the one end of the scale in terms of uh, computer uh, performance, which is the, I think, I don't know if it still is, but for a time, this Summit supercomputer was the fastest computer in the world. It's at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. It has two and a half million processors, three petabytes of RAM, and its performance is rated at 200 petaflops, uh, 200 um, quadrillion floating point operations per second. Um, and it's 10 megawatts. So you, you basically need a, uh, almost a dedicated power plant to run that thing. Um, and then on the lowest end is this is the this is the this is the processor this is the Atmel uh, the Atmel processor the Arduino processor that we used to use in this class and uh, it's an 8-bit processor and uh, it runs at less than 20 megahertz normally they're 16 megahertz the one that we had was clocked at 16 megahertz and they're 20 milliwatts uh, of power uh, and they do about 10 megaflops per second. I'm sorry, uh, 200 kiloflops per second is the performance, right? 
So you might say, well, okay, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, so what's your point? Well, the, the interesting thing about this is if you look at the efficiency, which is the throughput divided by the power, right, where you're getting um, flops per second per watt, right? If you look at the performance per watt, which is actually equivalent, by the way, to um, uh, energy, uh, uh, energy um, ops per energy, right? So the, the, the energy you, the, 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 you, that you pay per, per operation. But typically when you have efficiency, at least for floating point applications, it's in gigaflops per watt, um, uh, or gigaflops per second per watt, technically. Um, the Summit supercomputer is, is, is rated about 20 gigaflops per second per watt. But when you get down to the um, Arduino, it's 10 megaflops per second per watt. So it turns out that the, the biggest computer in the world, you don't think of it as being efficient, right? Because it needs a, like a power plant to power it. It's, it's, it uses a ton of power, right? But if you look at its efficiency, it's actually about 20,000 times more efficient than an embedded, a smaller embedded system, <laughs> which seems odd. But the reason for that is because with these large scale machines, you get economies of scale, right? That you don't get in these smaller, more compact, um, lower power systems. And that applies to even like, for example, your phone, you know, like your smartphone is much less efficient than your desktop computer just because of the nature of these small, low power embedded systems. It's very hard to make those things efficient. Uh, even though they use less power than desktop computer, they're actually less power efficient. Uh, so there's that weird uh, trade-off there. And then, of course, you've got the Raspberry Pi, which is kind of in the middle uh, between these two, obviously. And this one is um, the Raspberry Pi 4 will do, do 27.2 gigaflops per second. It maxes out, I think, around 15 watts. And so it's like 1.8 gigaflops per second per watt. So um, the Raspberry Pi is like thousands of times, uh, sorry, um, 180 times less power, uh, more power efficient rather than the uh, Arduino, but the summer supercomputer is uh, 10 times more efficient than like the Raspberry Pi. Yes? Could one could make efficient smartphone, but it can require you to go and charge it every four hours, for example. So it's, it's rather not the, not the question of making it power efficient or not the question of what your purpose is. So if yeah. you want your cell phone last longer, you might make it less power efficient. But if you want to push power efficiency, you might sacrifice that you need to charge it often. Right. Yeah. And that's an, another trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Something that's not discussed much in CSE, uh, like the programming class, the intro to programming classes. Um, okay. So, um, that's my intro slides out of the way. Uh, so the main, first uh, substantive topic is um, hardware software interfacing. So have any of you, you guys took, uh, you guys all took CSE 212, right? That computer architecture, computer organization design. Um, and you, so in that class, you learn a lot about how computer processors work. You know, you learn the, the software hardware interface, which is the assembly language and machine language and the encoding formats. And then you get into the microarchitecture, which is how you actually build the processor, the data paths, the pipelining, the functional units and all that stuff, right? And then you talk about computer arithmetic and how that works. Uh, but did you ever wonder though, when you're taking that class, why they never mention the processor communicating with anything other than memory? Right, they don't talk about I/O at all in 2.12, for instance. Like they basically say, well, there's, you know, if you have a, if a uh, an instruction set architecture, which is your assembly language and your repertoire of instructions, you got pretty much three different types of instructions. You got arithmetic instructions, which do number crunching, computation, and then you've got your uh, control instructions that control the flow of instructions, like branches and jumps. Right, that's how you implement if statements and loops and subroutine calls. And then you got your loads and stores. So those are your three types of instructions. It's like, okay, I got it. It's like, but how do you print something on a printer if that's all you can do? How do you, how do you draw a square on a monitor? Obviously not covered by those instructions, right? Like, how do you do that? They never mentioned that. And I remember when I was taking that class, I was thinking that. I was like, okay, this is cool, but I know a, CPU, a processor can do a lot more than just loads and stores 
and arithmetic and control instructions because I can send packets on a network. How's that? What's it? How, what's it? Which instructions does it use to send a packet? Like unclear, right? Well, as it turns out, um, the answer to that is it uses loads and stores. The loads and store instructions that were taught to you in 2.12 were presented as if you just loaded and stored to memory. Like you're like, oh, you got a CPU and you got a memory. And you know, the loads and stores are how you exchange values between memory and the CPU, right? But it turns out that that's also the way the, you, you actually communicate with I.O. devices as well, right? In fact, loads and stores are the only conduit in which a CPU can communicate with the outside world. It's through the mechanism of loads and stores. Fundamentally, it, it all goes through loads and stores. Yes? I thought it was involving foot calls, like loading, to, like storing to certain red, uh, well, all controlled by the terminal. Sit, that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. The loads and stores that do the I.O. are only performed by the kernel. The operating system, that's correct. And the way that a user I.O., I'm sorry, the way that a user program uh, asks the kernel to do that on behalf of it is through a syscall. So that, that's true. But fundamentally, once you get into the kernel, how does the CPU go, hey, printer, print hello world? You know, like how, how does it fundamentally do that? It does it through storing to the printer, through store instructions. Ultimately, it all comes down to a store instruction when it comes to sending data out of the CPU and when it comes to bringing data in, it's through a load instruction. They just didn't tell you. They acted in 2.12 as if all loads and stores go to memory. But in fact, some of them don't. Some of them go to I.O. address, uh, I.O. Uh, devices, peripherals. Yes? Like in Linux, there is this file and given devices have some kind of file. So if you want to actually say, Cisco, go and print you actually kind of write in that information to a special type of file, and then that file is interpreted as a command sent to the printer. Right, but, but ultimately, what, what, when you do that, it's still eventually going to store, do loads and stores, right? You, that's just the programmer abstraction is writing to a file and reading from a file. But the, the physical instructions that correspond to the actual I.O. are loads and stores. Um, so what that's called is programmed I.O. A programmed I.O. is when... Um, you have ranges of memory addresses that correspond to specific I.O. IO address, uh, I.O. devices, I.O. peripherals, right? So in other words, you'll have a range of addresses that maps to your RAM, but then there's other ranges within that same memory space. And when I say memory space, by the way, all that means is it's, an, it's just a memory address. You have a flat memory address from 0 to 2 to the 48th power minus 1. So it's, that's just your memory address, assuming a 48-bit address, right? And then you take those ranges of address, that, that range of addresses, and you can partition it into sections that correspond to the main system RAM or to various peripherals. Each peripheral is going to get one range. Well, it could have more than one range, but it, there, generally speaking, there's going to be one range that maps to a peripheral or to a certain functionality on a peripheral, okay? So when I say peripheral, what do I mean? Okay, well, this, so generally, the way it works is the peripherals the CPU communicates with nowadays are all on the same chip as the CPU. So, and then if you have off-chip peripherals, like a USB drive, for instance, a USB device, if it's an off-chip, if it's an external peripheral, it actually gets processed through an interface that's on the chip. So what that means is that the CPU is connected to an on-chip interconnect like a, a network that's on side, in, inside the chip, right? And then on the chip, you're going to have these interfaces, like a USB interface or an SPI or some, some, some kind of I.O. interface that the CPU can address through load and store instructions through specific ranges. And then if needed, that interface can then go off chip to then talk to an off chip peripheral. These things act like uh, bridges or like interfaces. You guys with me? So like they're like endpoints, right? So in this example, I've got a CPU and I've got a memory that's on chip, an on chip memory. You might say, well, memory is usually off chip, right? Yeah, but like if you have an Arduino or a small embedded processor, you may have the memory on chip, right? Or you may just have a cache on chip and the main system memory off chip, right? But you'll have a memory on the chip and then you'll have that, you know, the interconnect, as I mentioned, and then you'll have these interfaces, 
like USB interface, SPI interface, uh, UART interface. If you have a phone processor, you may have a modem on there, you know, your wireless modem to go to the cell network and that kind of stuff. Um, and those are all on the chip. And then each one of those, each one of those peripherals has an I.O. Uh, address range. So the address range is a starting address and an ending address, right? Or it may just be a starting address, which is called the base address in a, in a, in a, in a size, in a range, right? So for example, the USB peripheral may have an address range of 100 in hex uh, to 1 FF in hex. Uh, so if I load or store to any address in that range, the CPU is effectively communicating with that peripheral, with the USB interface, right? Now, it may ask that USB interface to then go and talk to a USB device, right? Which it then will, it'll do through I.O. pins that go off chip. Does that make sense? So fundamentally, you're just reading and writing to specific addresses by loading or storing to those addresses. And those addresses have to match up to the addresses that match to each one of the peripherals, right? Or if you go outside of the range, you, 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 may, you, know, you may be just in the range of your memory, in which case it just acts like the type of loads and stores you discussed in 2.12, which is just exchanging the values with memory. Does that make sense? So that's, that's called programmed I.O. And whenever you do a load or store through programmed I.O., you're writing to, um, the terminology is a little weird and kind of outdated, but they have this notion of a status register and a control register. A status register is, they're both essentially the same thing. The, the reason why they have different names is status registers are usually things that you read and control registers are usually things that you write. So status register is a way to get input and a control register is a way to send output, right? Uh, but sometimes you can do both. You can read and write these registers. So that, that terminology is a little outdated. I always just call them I.O. registers, right? And an I.O. register, and you might say, why are we calling them registers now instead of memory addresses? The, each, each location inside of an address range corresponding to a peripheral each addressable location is, called a, is referred to as a register, which is kind of confusing, right? Because you've got registers in the CPU, but then you've got these set of registers for each one of your peripherals that you access through loads and stores through specific address ranges. Does that make sense? So that's how, that's how you do I.O with that's 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 no matter what processor you have it doesn't matter if you're if you're using an Intel i7 and Arduino AT mega or I should say Atmel AT mega chip or a Teensy or an ARM processor they all work this way fundamentally all communication is handled through loads and stores to IO address ranges and that's what the drivers do, by the way. If you have an operating system, the drivers are doing that. Now, one thing I, I didn't mention earlier, I should have. Um, in this class, we're not going to use an operating system, so you don't have to use system calls to have the operating system driver do this on behalf of the user. You can do it yourself because we're doing bare metal programming. We're just writing code that runs without an operating system. Uh, and when you write code for uh, an Arduino, that's how it's done. Some of you have probably written Arduino code. Actually, you all should have in 2.11, right? So you all have written Arduino code. That's bare metal. There's no operating, Arduinos can't run an operating system. Um, if you've ever written GPU code using CUDA, right? GPUs don't have an operating system, so all GPU code is bare metal. Um, now, if you're writing code for a phone, your phone processor does run, you know, Linux, Right or BSD if you have a, if you have a, an Apple uh, an iPhone right fundamentally it's running a Unix style operating system but that's on the main processor your phone probably has maybe 20 different processors and all the ones besides the main ARM processor those are all running bare metal code right so your DSP your GPU your crypto processor your uh, neuromorphic processor those are all running bare metal code. Right, so most embedded program, most embedded system programming is done in bare metal. Um, it, you, know, you usually don't have the uh, benefit of an operating system. And when I say you know, when I say benefit, I mean that if you have a bug in your bare metal code, 
it just crashes the whole system. It doesn't seg fault, right, and give you a core dump. It just, you know, dies. You have to restart it, right? So uh, bare metal programming is unforgiving, uh, but you don't have to, you, you can do direct software hardware interfacing. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a question I'll ask for this. What's the size of the USB peripherals IO space? What's the size? The size, how do we get the size? Well, we have a range. So these are presented as a range, 100 to 1 FF. Um, like I said, sometimes they won't give you a range. They'll just give you a base and then the size. But in this case, I don't give you the size. I just give you the range. So what's the size? Uh, the size is the, just basically just the difference between uh, the range, right? So in this case, it's 1 FF minus 100. But then you have to add 1 because those are inclusive. That, that range is inclusive, right? So it's 1 FF minus 100 plus 1. So in order to do that, you have to be comfortable with hexadecimal arithmetic. Uh, so we have to take 1 FF, subtract 100, and add 1. The answer is 100. So what's 100? What's 100 in hex? In decimal, it's, um, it's going to be 16 to the second power, right? So 256. It's 256 bytes. Um, that's a pretty small, usually I.O. ranges are, in, in, depending on what kind of system you're using, they can be much larger than that. But in this case, uh, the USB peripheral sp uh, space is 256 bytes. Now you might say, wait a second, does that, mean, does that mean I can only send 256 bytes to a USB device? No, no, it doesn't. The, this, the total size of the IO address space is 256 bytes, but that doesn't mean, that's not, that does not imply there's any kind of limit on what you, how much data you can send through it. That's the space of the, uh, the, the IO registers in there. And so normally if you want to send a byte, um, or you want to send a, a message on to a USB device, you write to a set of those registers for every, for every message you want to send, and then you can do that repeatedly in the software, and then you can send as large of a message you want. All right, that makes sense? <clears throat> okay, there, there, there'd be some sort of, there, there's some sort of protocol that you have to use in order to, to send and receive messages, uh, where the protocol is a sequence of writes you have to do in there, but that varies depending on the peripheral. Um, so let's, let's, show, let's show an example of that. So for example, if you look at the, the data sheet for this USB peripheral, uh, you'll see a set of registers uh, that each have their own address within that range of addresses, a different offset, I should say. So offset zero would be you know, starting at the base uh, address, offset four would start at 104, right? 100 plus four, right? Offset eight would be 100 plus eight, 108. Uh, but each one of those offsets, each one of those addresses would have a, a register associated with it that serves a specific purpose. And in order to figure out what that purpose is, you have to read the data sheet. So in order to, to communicate through devices through that, that peripheral, you have to read the data sheet to figure out you know, what the I.O. addresses do, what they mean. Um, and normally, when you look at those, they're kind of split together, they're split apart into bit fields. So generally speaking, each one of those registers will have certain bits within that value, that, that I.O. register, that means certain things. It's very common. Um, so you'll have a bit that, that, you know, different bits in there that signify different things, either as a way to signal out to that device or to read something back from that device. So here's just an example that I made up. So this is an 8-bit, uh, this is an 8-bit register, and, and the reason it's 8 bits is because um, this is sort of implying that you're on a sort of an Arduino device, an 8-bit device. But if you're on a 32-bit or a 64-bit device, you'll have, you know, obviously the, the, the size of this register will depend on the CPU that you're, that you're using. But they all look like this. They have different bit fields. So in this case, we've got the different bits here, and then each one of these bits has a corresponding symbol associated with it, and then a mode, whether you can write to that bit field only or, or read only from the bit field. So in this case, you know, we'll have, for example, bit 7 will be halt. So, you know, if you write halt, if you write 1 into 
halt, it'll stop the device. One, then that's an output, right? So that's a way to send a signal out to tell it to halt. Um, on fire would be like a flag that you would read to see if it's something's on fire, right? And that could be bit, that's in this case, it's bit six. And then you might have a, a in this case, a three bit field called temp, which gives you an idea of what the temperature is. So that would be an input. These are, like I said, these are just made up values, obviously. Um, but you, you, essentially you have to load or store. And when you load or store to that address, you have to be able to manipulate the bits in there. You have to be able to read certain bits or write certain bits in there. And that's, so that, that's usually the thing you have to do in addition to loading or storing to that address. Okay. So a big part of this hardware software interfacing is not only loading or storing. Well, one, there's, there's, a, there's three things. You have to know the address range of the peripheral and you have to know its list of uh, registers that, that you want to load or store. But you also have to do this bit manipulation to be able to manipulate the bits within each one of those registers, each one of those locations that you read or write. So how do you do that? Uh, some of you probably already know this. Um, but on the other hand, like none of the programming courses you've, uh, maybe again, robotics, you might have done this in robotics, but a lot of the um, sort of general programming courses that you take, you don't have to do bit manipulation very often. In embedded systems programming, it's very common. So let's say, for instance, I have an 8-bit value called val, and I want to set bit 2. Now, these bits are numbered from right to left starting at 0. So you've got bit 0 up over here on the right um, up to bit 7 on the left. Okay. Let's say I just want to set bit 2 to the value 1. I don't want to affect any other bits, just that one bit. I just want to set that one bit to 1. I want to force bit 2 to be 1. How do I, how do, I do that? Um, well, there's, there's several ways to do it. Uh, the way, one way to do it is you can take a temporary value and set it to 1. And then you can shift that temporary value two bits to the left. Now, you guys learned about shift instructions in 212, but you might not have ever used a shift instruction. And, and uh, by the way, if you're in a high level language like C or Java, the shift is implemented with the less than, less than for shift left and greater than, greater than for shift right. So if I take the value of temp, I could set it to one, and then I can shift that, that one bit two bits to the left, which will position a one bit in the same location as the bit that I'm planning to set to one. You see where I'm going with this? So I got, I basically maneuvered a bit into the right slot. That then I can use a, a, I can use a bitwise or uh, with the original, between the original value and the new value, the temporary value. If I do a bitwise or, that will take bit two in the original value and set it to one. It makes sense? Yes? Is that like a, it's typical to two places, is like a constant rule, or is this is just a case where you're changing bit, bit two? It's just if you're changing bit two. Yeah, because, because if, if, if I knew, if, if, if bit two was a constant, then I didn't have to actually set, the, set this to one and then shift it. I could have just set it to eight, because two raised to the, the uh, um, I'm sorry, four rather. 2 raised to the second power is 4, right? So I could have just put a 4. I could have just set temp to 4. And the value 4, because, it, because 4 is 2 raised to the second power, it just happens to you know, be a value where a 1 bit is in bit 2, right? The bit 2 is set to 1, right? But the reason, I set it, the reason I set temp to 1 first, and then I shifted it by 2 bits, is because that 2 can be any bit you want to set to one, right? So this two could be a constant if you want, although it's kind of redundant because if, like I said, if it was a constant, then there's really no need to set this to one and shift it. You could have just set temp to four to begin with, right? But, but let's say I didn't know what I, which bit I wanted to set. Say that's a variable of some kind, right? Then I, can, um, I could set temp to a constant one and then I can shift it left by the number of the bit that I want to flip right, in, in the target, right? The target bit is two, I want to turn bit two on. So I shift temp two bits to the left, 
right? And all that does is it prepares a value which I can then do an or to set bit two in the original value, right? So that, that's, I mean, that's just one, there's other ways to do this, but that's, that's one way to do it. it. It relies on a shift operation and a bitwise or. Bitwise or, by the way, in, um, in Java and C is a single bar, vertical bar. So the line of code that would do this, this is the actual code, which would be val equals val bitwise or with one shifted left by two bits, right? So this one line of code will set that bit to one. Now you might say, what, if, what happens if it was already one? What if, it, what, if the, what if this was already one instead of zero, right? What would happen then? Nothing, it wouldn't do anything because one or with one is still one, right? So it wouldn't have any effect. But this line of code will guarantee that by the time that's done, bit two will be set to one, right? Okay. Um, what happens if I wanna clear a bit now? Let's say I wanna set a certain bit to zero. So say I wanna take bit two, I wanna set it to zero. Sometimes you wanna set, you know, setting a bit to zero will have some special meaning in the data sheet for a peripheral. If that's the case, then, um, how do I do that? I can't use or anymore, right? Well, this one's actually a little bit more complicated. So I do the same thing I did before. I take a constant one and I shift it two bits to the left. So I get a one underneath that bit that I wanna to turn to zero, right? But now I've got a problem because I can't or it, I can't and it. Um, what do I do with it? How do I set it to zero? Well, the way what you do then is you, you do an extra step, which is you do a bitwise complement of that value. So you take the value that you get after shifting one, two bits to the left, and you do a bitwise complement, which is a tilde in Java and C. And that will set every bit to one, except for the one bit that you set, bit two. And then instead of oring, you can and, you could do a bitwise and between the original value and the temporary value. And what that will do is it will mask off that one bit that you wanted to set to zero. Make sense? So it'll, it'll, it'll take that one and it'll zero it out, but it won't, it'll leave all the other bits alone because all the other bits will have a, a one underneath of them. Yes? Oh yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> that should be zero there, you're right. There you go, yeah, thank you. Okay, so set bit two to zero, yeah, that'll zero it out. So the line of code here is val and, and then the tilde, and in the parentheses, one shifted left by two bits. Make sense? So that'll, that'll zero out a specific bit. What if I wanna isolate? So that basically in that case, I'm writing. I'm writing a zero into a certain bit. I'm writing a one into a certain bit. But what if I wanna read a bit? I wanna read a certain bit. Like I, like, like I, wanna, I wanna figure out which, which bits are in a certain location. Um, so that would be isolating a specific bit. How do I isolate, in this case, bit three? I wanna get bit three out of this value. I just wanna know what bit three is. I don't care about the other bits. Uh, so there's a couple, there's different ways you can do that. Um, one way is to shift that value three bits to the right, okay? So what that'll do is it'll end up shifting three zeros in the left-hand side and it'll position that bit I'm interested in as the least significant bit. So it'll shift out the three bits that are to the right of the bit of interest, and it'll shift three zeros into the left-hand side, right? Oh yeah. You guys with me? Okay, and then what? Then I can, I can do a bitwise and 
with one. I can bitwise AND with one, and that will isolate bit three, and it'll make sure that all the other bits are zero. So it'll isolate bit three, and it'll put it in the, in the it'll write justify it too, which you may or may not care about doing. In this case, I'm gonna assume I wanna write justify it. So what's, what's the point here? The point is, is I shift, then I mask. And that, that's one way to isolate a specific bit. Um, but if I don't care about write, write justifying the value, then uh, I don't need to do the shift part, right? I can just say, I can take a, a, a temporary value, shift it three bits to the left. So I could take one, shift it three bits to the left, have a one bit there on that bit position, and then I can do the and. And the result of that will either be zeros or a single one bit, but in bit position three. So if I was doing, if I just wanted this to be a Boolean, you know, a zero or non-zero, then I can do it that way. Does that make sense? So it's, th these are all just shifts and it, it's, it's all involving shifting and masking or shifting and oring. So we're combining together these shift operations and um, the bitwise logical operators, which again, like I, I'm sure you, you guys probably haven't used those before, but you're, you were aware of them from 2.12, but it's not something that you typically would use. You don't use these very often in, in regular programming classes, but when you're doing IO stuff, you use it a lot. It's, you use these kind of things constantly because like I said, these, these status and control registers are always uh, decomposed in a bit fields. <clears throat> okay, how about a range of bits? What if I want to, what if I want bits five down to three? How many bits is that? It's five minus three plus one because it's inclusive. So it's three bits. Five down to three is three bits. Five, four, three, right? Three bits. I just want those three bits. I don't want the other bits. I want to extract those three bits out. Um, you can shift by three, which now when you shift to the right, by the way, you're going to be subtracting the shift amount from each of these. So after I shift this value by three bits, the bits I'm looking at are no longer going to be bits five down to three. It's going to be two down to zero after I shift because you have to subtract because these bits will be moved to the right. Does that make sense? So I'm just moving, I'm just moving the bits down, but then I still have these bits, these two garbage, I have these zeros that got shifted in, but I have these two garbage bits in here I don't care about, the original bit seven and the original bit six, which are now in bits seven, six, five, four, and three, <laughs> right? So how do I get rid of those? Well, I have to mask, but now masking is a little weirder because I'm not looking just for one bit. Now I wanna mask I want to mask out those low order three bits. So for that, and this is the most complicated one, for that, um, I can take a one, shift it left by three. Why three? Because I want three bits. I want to isolate three bits. That'll give me what? Two to the third power, which is eight. But then if I subtract one, I'll get seven. You might say, well, who care? why seven? Who do you, why, why, why did you pick seven? Because seven is one, one, one. I want three ones, right? So if I take one and shift it by the number of bits that I want to isolate and then just subtract one, I'll get a sequence of, I'll get N one bits. So in this case, I'll say one, shift left by three, subtract one, that will give me seven. And the whole reason I want seven is because I want that sequence of, three one bits in the rightmost positions, which I can then use as a bit mask and then extract out those three from uh, the original value. Yes? What can happen between the shifting? Is that when you shift, you actually lose bits on the right side. So that's what if you don't want to keep the initial copy of the value, or if you care what was initially, you probably should copy and then do this thing with the copy of the value if you do care to keep while I'm touching. Another mm -hmm. option is actually you can uh, not shift the wall, but shift the value which you're trying to, to uh, 
to map again. For example, if you have 0, 7, then you can then move 0, 7, 3 bits to the left and end with the original values. Mm -hmm. so this way you will not lose bits on the right and will get bits which you're actually interested in. Right, yeah, that's if you don't care about right justifying them, right? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't care about those bits staying in 5, 4, and 3. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, the reason, though, that I, I, I'm destroying, that's a good point, but the reason I'm destroying the original value of val is because I'm assuming these are coming from a, a register, an I.O. register, right? So the only, I am losing, by doing the shifting and the masking, I am losing the original value, but only the version of it that I've loaded. The original value is actually in the I.O. device, which still exists on the I.O. device, right? So basically, whenever you load from a status register or from a uh, per peripheral, you're making a copy from using the load, right? You're copying data out of an, a peripheral, right? You're copying data. You're basically reading a word from an I.O. device. You bring it into a register. That register then is inside the CPU is then disposable. I can overwrite it because if I ever wanted that original value again, I can then just reload again from the I.O. device, right? So that, that's a good point. I'm destroying the original value of val here. I'm overwrite. Actually, I'm not. Actually, I'm not in this case. This, this doesn't actually show val being overwritten. I think the previous slide did though. Did it? No, actually it didn't. Um, but yeah, but the point is, I, I see what just, this is just an expression. I'm not, I'm not sending it back to Val. But you're right, normally you would overwrite Val with that just because you don't care about destroying that value. You're not destroying it on the peripheral. That, that's a good point because remember when you load, when you, when you do programmed I.O. and you load from the peripheral, you're just making a copy of that value in your register file on your CPU. You're not actually changing it on the peripheral until you store it back, right? So, Basically what's happening is these bit manipulation things are happening inside the CPU's private space. You load something from a peripheral, you, cr you, you number crunch it inside the CPU, and then you send the result back to the peripheral, right? But val is just a, is just a temporary holding spot for the original value of that register. Yes? Why not shift it at the beginning to the left, and then you wouldn't have to load in the meeting Oh, you could, oh yeah, that's a good point. You could take this original value, shift it to the left, and then shift it back to the right. Yeah, you could do two shifts as well. That's another way to do it. If I had taken this value and shifted it two bits to the left, it would have deleted these two bits, right? And it would have shifted in two zeros down here. But then I would have, I had, I would have had my bits on the left side, right? So I might, maybe that's okay, but maybe, usually you don't want that, right? Then I could have shifted them back, how many? two over, and then what, five back? Yeah, five bits back. So I could have went two bits to the left, then five bits to the right, and that would have accomplished the same thing. Yeah, that's a good point. That's another option. Uh, it's memory efficient, but I think, I don't know how costly it is actually. It, you're just talking about, in, like you're talking about, the number of instructions probably the same. You're right, it, it takes an extra register to do the temp. It, it's negligible, it's, yeah. Okay, so these, this is just a summary of what I showed. Um, and again, like, like Angela said, there's different ways you can do it. This, these are just one way to do it. So if I want to set bit n to 1, I use this line of code where n is replaced by the bit I want to set. This is for a single bit. If I want to set bit n to 0, I use this line of code. If I want to isolate or extract or read bits n down to m, where n is greater than or equal to m, then I can use this line of code. Um, now notice in this case, I shift right by m, because m is the right side of the range, and then I bit mask 1 uh, shifted by n minus m plus 1, which is the, the number of bits, um, and then 
subtract one from that and then and then do a do, do an, an and. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, hold on here. What is the order of operations here? Like, is it how do you know it's not going to and before it does the subtract? And why did you put parentheses around the shift? Right. Uh, that was very deliberate, and it's very easy to get hurt by this. You do have to pay attention to the operator precedence. The operator precedence is um, add and subtract have the highest precedence, then shift, and then the bitwise logical. So the reason I put parentheses around this shift is because if I hadn't done that, this minus one would have been combined with this expression, and that would have happened before the shift. So I had to make sure that I put parentheses around this shift, but then when it came to the, this minus competing with this ampersand, the minus happens first, right? Which is what I want, right? So this would be like saying, I want three bits, so I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna move it to the left by three bits, that gives me eight, then I wanna subtract one, which gives me seven, because seven is a one, 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 that's my bit mask, and then I wanna take that one, one, one and and it against the, the original value, right? So this was done very deliberately, but if you're not sure, it's better to use more parentheses, right? So keep that in mind. There's an there's operator precedence. You want to make sure that when you write a line of code like this, it does the uh, operations in the, uh, in the order that you assume. Well, actually, sometimes my codes do look like parentheses, parentheses, more parentheses. Because mm -hmm. it's just like, you make it for sure, whatever, whatever operation says, and since just put parentheses and quit calmly, that it works like you expect. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's safer that way, I think. Or you could even you could even put them on multiple lines of code too. Instead of in, you could you could outline these in multiple lines. Okay, so that's all the bit manipulation stuff. Any questions about that? I'll go back and I'll review that again next lecture since we're going to be two weeks before we're back. Um, okay, although we do have a quiz, I have a quiz that asks you to do a few of those, but it's just like I said, we're going to have. The quizzes are just for practice, and like I said, you can take them twice, and, and um, so it'll give you a way to test yourself. Um, okay, so how do you do loads and stores using C? Uh, well, this is something that you might not be aware of because you guys used Python, uh, no, used uh, Java in 146, 145, 146, right? Programming one and two. Then even when you took ro robotics, 274, you guys use Python. And if you took 240, which you should have by now, use C++, right? So C++ and C are similar in this sense, but um, C has this thing called pointers. And loads and stores, like when I say load and store, what am I talking about? I'm talking about assembly language here, right? I'm talking about the actual load and store instructions which allow the CPU to communicate with the outside world, right? It's all done through loads and stores, as I mentioned. But how do you make the compiler generate a load or store instruction is the question, right? Because you can't just say load and store in C. That's not part of the C language or C++. I have to write code in C that will guarantee that the load or store instruction be generated in the assembly code. So thus I can do program.io and talk to my peripherals. Um, the way that's done is through uh, the star. So the star is called a, a dereference, but the dereference only works on a pointer. So in this case, I have something called address. That address is, well, it's an address, and it was declared as a pointer in C. If I dereference that address, and that dereferencing operation is on the, the right-hand side of an assignment, that gets translated to a load instruction. And if I do the same thing on the left-hand side, that gets translated into a store. Okay, so there's a little bit here to unpack. The, um, the first of all, the presumption here is I'm doing an assignment, right? So, uh, by, wait, I'm missing a semicolon on that first one, technically. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is a line of C or C++ code. I have an address, I stick a star in front of it, but just putting the star in front of it alone doesn't tell the compiler how to generate the code. It depends on what side of an assignment that it's on. If it's on the right-hand side of assignment, what that's saying is take the address, load from it, and then put the result into that target, which is going to be a variable. 
okay? And then likewise, if I have a variable and I assign it to a dereferenced pointer, that just becomes a store instruction, right? And that's basically it. I mean, it's um, a load or a store. Now, the problem is, is that, now, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that that address, by the way, this address, I'm assuming that that address is, 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 an, is an address that's inside of an I.O. range of a peripheral, right? It's this magic address, basically, that points not to memory, but to a peripheral, right? Now, the problem is, though, is that you can get burned by this, though, because depending on what processor you're using, if it has a cache, you guys know about caches, right? From 212, you should have talked about caches. Caches are basically a smaller memory that's on chip that back up the main memory. Right. If you have a cache, this, this, these lines of code maybe get intercepted by the cache. In other words, if I load from an I.O. address, I may not be actually getting data from the peripheral. I might be getting it from the cache. Right. And if I store to an address, it may not go to the peripheral. It may go to the cache. Right. So you have to be careful about that. How do you deal with that? Well, most, if you have this problem, then sometimes you, you're, well, I, well let, me, let me clarify. If you're on an Arduino, you don't have to worry about this, right? Um, but if you're on a, process, a bigger processor, like an ARM processor or a MIPS processor, right? Or the one that we use in our class, the NEOS processor, the one that we're going to be using. If you're on a bigger processor, you have to use a special variant of the load and store that will bypass the cache. Those are usually called load IO or store IO instructions. It's the same thing as a load or a store. The only difference is, is that it tells the hardware to not go through the cache because this is not a memory operation. This is an IO operation, right? So then you might say, well, then how do you, how do you guarantee that? If that's the case, then you're going to have to use an intrinsic. An intrinsic is a, it looks like a function. But it's not a function. It's a special function that maps to a specific instruction. In the case of, in this class, we use something called IO read 32 and IO write 32. So instead of using the dereference on the right hand side, we use IO read 32 with the address. And instead of doing the dereference on the left hand side, we use IO write 32 address and val, right? All that does is it performs a programmed I.O. operation, which is our load or store to a specific address, but it uses the proper instruction to not get stuck in the cache, right? Because you don't want to use the cache if it's a programmed I.O., right? Because you need to be able to get data directly from the peripheral. You want to communicate directly to the per peripheral. Make sense? So we'll be doing this in this class. Different CPUs have different versions of this. So this is something you, you'd have to look up for whatever processor you're using. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Sure. Yeah, when, uh, when I was starting on the my address and starting programming, I was starting with C and then as a C++. Originally it was pure and same, but that made my life so much easier later. So yes, maybe pointers might seem not quite intuitive for you, but from my experience, Understanding it at the beginning makes your life much easier, especially if you're going to work with embedded systems or things with the hardware. So just just a note. Oh, and by the way, I, I didn't mention this, but that address, this address is would be something in this case to be hard coded, like it would usually come from a header or something. It's a hard coded address. That that's a specific hardware address. Oh, and by the way, too, by the way, uh, t t t t we mentioned this earlier, but only the op if you have an operating system, only the operating system is allowed to do this. And so if you're running Linux, you can't do this. Only the, um, you, the driver can do this, right? But, we're, if, but if you're writing on bare metal without an operating system, then you're allowed to do this. Uh, by the way, there is a caveat to that, though. In Linux, Linux has a way to get around that, actually. I'll just mention, Linux has this thing called the dev mem file. Angela mentioned device files. There's something called dev mem. And you can use another system call called mmap on dev mem. And you can, make, you can then give access to direct access to memory addresses like this. But you have to be super user to do it. 
and it requires you to do a, a memory map on dev mem. So there is a little workaround, and lin even in Linux, you can get access to physical addresses like that, but only as the root account. Okay. Um, okay, so I have a couple example questions here. I just want to go through these quick because these, these are similar to the ones I have on the, uh, the quiz. Uh, so let's say, let's say we have a, let's say we have this, um, this IO register, which I called PNTLS. The reason I gave it such a name like that is because IO registers usually have like acronyms like that, you know, like, um, and so we have PNTLS and you'll notice that uh, um, the PNTLS reg is number 16, has an offset of 16 inside the USB device. So the reason I, I sh I'm showing this is because I've got this thing called the PNTLS, I'm declaring as a pointer here, uh, a pointer to an 8-bit quantity. So it's a uint8 underscore t star. Okay, so it's a pointer to an unsigned 8-bit value. I put volatile in front of it here because on the, um, on the Arduino, in order to tell it you're doing an I.O. operation, instead of using intrinsic, you just have the pointer as volatile. It's just a way to tell the compiler to generate the right instruction. But again, this is something that depends on what processor uh, you're using. Uh, now that address is calculated as the base address for the USB device or the USB peripheral, and then I'm adding the offset. So I'm just basically just calculating the address from these two values, which are from a header file. So this is a typical way to calculate. Remember I mentioned that the address is hard-coded. This is what I mean by hard-coded address. It's just values that are defined for that specific uh, register. Um, and so. Base plus offset from the base. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah, base plus offset. Um, and then if I wanna set the halt bit, the halt bit is bit seven. I wanna tell this peripheral to halt, to shut down. So the way I do it is um, I use the code I showed you guys earlier where I'm gonna take, um, the contents of that address, now I'm doing some inlining, I'm, I'm packing a lot in this one line of code. Instead of having the val, like I showed before I had val, instead of having a val variable, now I'm just inlining that and I'm saying the contents of the PLTS. So I, I set PLTS, which is a hard-coded address, and then I dereference it here on the left hand, I'm sorry, on the right hand side of an assignment. So this turns into an, a load. So I'm gonna load the, the, the register, I'm gonna shift it three, bits to the left. Oh, that's the temperature though. Why? Oh, that's the, yeah, sorry, forget that. That's reading the temperature. Let's, let's do the halt. So for the halt, again, I read the PNTLS, and then I OR that with one shift to the left by halt, where halt is just a, a constant seven, right? And that'll set it to one. And if I want to set it to zero, then I could do the same thing, except instead of an OR, I do an AND, and then I have a bitwise complement there on that part to clear. So this will halt and this will unhalt. Now it looks complicated because I've inlined, you know, I've packed all this into one line of code, uh, but that's basically what's happening there. And then for the temperature, it, for the temperature, I take the PN, PLTS, shift it right by three bits, and then I end it with one shifted left by three bits minus one, which basically right aligns it and extracts the three bits that I want. So again, it's just, it's just what I showed before, but I'm now combining everything into one line of code. And this is exactly how you do it on the, um, on the Arduino-based processors. That's, that's, how, that's how you would do it there. Um, so here's another example question. Write a line of C, C++ code that sets the value of bit four to the value zero in the variable name my var, leaving the other bits unchanged. So basically, that's it. I just do it the and. I and it with essentially all ones with a zero in bit position four. Okay, here's another example question. Uh, this one's a little obnoxious, <laughs> actually. Um, this one is needlessly complex, but it says, consider the following snippet of C code. I declare an 8-bit variable X, and I declare an 8-bit variable Y, and v Y is where I take x, basically take the 
high order four bits of X and put them in the low order four bits by doing this shift. And then I combine that with um, the low order four bits, which I get through this AND operation, negated or complemented, I should say, and then shifted four bits to the left to put in the upper four bits and then I combine them together. So basically what this does is it takes the upper four bits and lower four bits and swaps them. But then it also, in addition to that, it also does a complement of the, low, the original lower four bits, right? So it takes the two halves and swaps them and the upper one, it complements, right? That's what that line of code does. Um, oh, I'm out of time, aren't I? Okay, I just realized I'm just out of time here. But anyway, there's four options here and um, you're asked to figure out which one of these does the equivalent operation. So you have to essentially uh, figure out which each of these does and compare it to the one on the top there.